The sons of former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak have been freed. And this comes after being behind bars for more than two years. Gamal and Ala Mubarak were facing trial with their father Hosni Mubarak. But the judge has ruled the duo cannot be detained any longer. CCTV's Adel Mahrui tells us more. Celebrations among supporters of the former president. And they are hoping for more to come. I am very happy that Mr. Ala and Mr. Gamal were released, but the judge should have said they are innocent. But it is a good step. Now our President Mubarak will soon get released and his innocence will be proven. The two are charged with their father for corruption perpetrated during his long rule. The former president is also charged with complicity in the killing of protesters during the uprising that toppled him more than two years ago. Mubarak has been granted a retrial thanks to irregularities in a first hearing. And the judge in the retrial is determined to maintain order. Judge Mahmoud Rashidi barred civil rights lawyers from Monday's hearing. He sifted through the evidence provided by the prosecution and then gave the defense team more time to assess the documents. The case will proceed quickly unlike the first trial. After the court revises the collected evidence, the hearing will begin. The court will listen to the prosecution, then to the defense. But generally, nothing new has been provided. It's just a matter of some procedures. Unlike previous judges, Mahmoud al-Rashidi managed to maintain discipline over the Mubarak trial. The defense team says it is the absence of civil rights lawyers that helped him to do so. The defense now has four weeks to study the case. And on the 6th of July, Egypt's trial of the century will continue. Adel Mahroui, CCTV, Cairo. Well, despite Hosni Mubarak's failing health, the courts granted the defendants a retrial following their appeal. CCTV's Carol Oyola now takes a look at the former Egyptian leader's court appearances in the past, as well as the other charges leveled against him. January 2011, Egypt was engulfed in political chaos. Protesters demanded the resignation of then-leader Hosni Mubarak. 11 February 2011 and Mubarak caved in. He stepped down, giving way to the military Supreme Council to run the country. Muhammad Husni Sayyid Mubarak. On 24 May, judicial officials announced that Mubarak, along with his two sons, would stand trial over the deaths of anti-government protesters. On 2nd June, he was found guilty of complicity in the murder of some of the demonstrators. Along with his former interior minister, Habib al-Adli, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. In January 2013, an Egyptian court allowed an appeal against Mubarak's and al-Adli's convictions and ordered a retrial. Mubarak and his sons would also be retried on corruption charges for which they were acquitted. Mubarak's trial had been due to begin in April, but the judge recused himself in a hearing that lasted just seconds. He referred the case to Cairo's appeals court to select a new panel of judges. Mubarak's health has been a bone of contention during his trial and incarceration. He suffered a heart attack after relinquishing power and had maintained that he was physically unfit to stand trial. He has been held since his guilty verdict last year. He is also charged with seizing public funds and misusing political influence. Mubarak and other defendants have pleaded not guilty to all charges. Carol Oyola, CCTV. Well, let's get more on Egypt's trial of the century. And for the latest on this, we're joined by Dr. Gamal Ahmed Gawad, a professor of Middle Eastern politics. He joins us live from Cairo. Dr. Gamal, thank you. Now, the court has ordered the releases of Gamal and Allah uh, Mubarak. What does this mean to this whole process? If I, if I hear you clearly, because there is uh, some noise in the sound, uh, but, but, but uh, uh, I, I believe this is, this is a, a ruling that essentially for technicalities. It's not a final verdict or anything. And this is politically speaking, uh, this is, uh, reflects for a great extent the situation where Egypt is uh, in, uh, right now. Egypt is a country that uh, went through a certain revolutionary experience, what looks like a revolution happened, but at the same time, 
the uh, existing legal system and the state institutions are there. A country that is torn apart between the status quo, the legal system on the one hand, and uh, the revolutionary measures on the other hand. The former president and his sons are on trial. This is revolutionary, but on the other hand, we see him uh, re released uh, for technical legal reasons. And I think the, the entire country is very much similar to this, a country that is again uh, hanging between uh, two kinds of, of logic, a revolutionary logic on the one hand and institutional legal politics uh, uh, on the other hand. All right. Uh, Dr. Gamal, uh, staying with the trial there, do we know, though, why the judge presiding over Hosni Mubarak's retrial earlier introduced further restrictions on those who can sit in on the proceedings? Well, uh, again, the, 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 the noise in the background is still there, but I, if I understand uh, you correctly, uh, well, uh, uh, Mubarak, uh, Mubarak's case is, uh, is, is now some, something that really belongs to the past, mainly. Uh, the the uh, current political, Egyptian politics is divided between different factions, uh, mainly uh, uh, secular on the one hand and Islamist on the, on the other hand. There is still pro-Mubarak forces, but actually Mubarak himself is no longer a symbol of political forces or social forces uh, uh, in the country. However, today's ruling is likely to, uh, to generate certain dynamics. Uh, certain political forces are, are likely to use this verdict to uh, uh, achieve political purposes. Not necessarily they are interested in the Mubarak case, but try to use it to advance their own political goals. So it will be integrated within the current uh, political conflict in the country. All right. Uh, Dr. Gamal, <clears throat> just a, a final point there, and very briefly, though, as you say, uh, the Mubarak case belongs uh, to the past. But how have Egyptians, though, in general, received the news of the release order today and the adjournment of the former president's retrial? Uh, let, let, let me put it this way. The, uh, uh, if, if I'm comparing what, uh, what's happening these days with a year ago, when the verdict was uh, made first on President Mubarak, uh, I can make a, a, a few comments. One comment is that the Egyptian public is no longer uh, interested in following this case. Uh, a year ago, uh, millions of people were watching uh, the broadcast of the, of the trial on, uh, on TV. Uh, these days, you can barely find anybody who is really uh, following the, uh, the news. Secondly, even though uh, Mubarak is not really vindicated uh, for the past, but uh, the, the anti-Mubarak feelings are declining. The suffering and the difficulties are facing the Egyptian people uh, past uh, in the, in the two years after the revolution, and in particular in the past year since the, the current president, Mohamed Morsi, was, was elected, actually make uh, many people uh, 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 more sympathetic to President Mubarak. Uh, and or at least uh, in a sense of reconsidering the negative feelings that they developed against him in the past. So it is, there is a different mood now in the country uh, when it comes to the former President Hosni Mubarak. All right, uh, Dr. Gamal Ahmed Gawa joining us there from Cairo. Thank you for your insights. Well, we'll take a short break here on Africa Live, but still ahead on the program. to the cocktail of, um, of toxins, of medicinal compounds, specially formulated for use on animals, so 100% safe to the rhino, but um, unfit for human consumption. Beware, South African rhino poachers put on notice. And Nelson Mandela's condition remains serious, but stable. Breaking news, global trends. CCTV News brings you stories with the different aspects of Africa in the international content. With our reporters across Africa and all over the world, we'll tell you about the real Africa and how it impacts the world. Africa Live, every day, only on CCTV News.
let's now turn our attention to the Horn of Africa region where in fighting between rival clan militia in the southern Somali port of Kismayu has left 17 people dead and is threatening to cause massive displacement. Kismayu has attracted several warlords, all of whom are seeking control of the lucrative port following the ousting of the Al-Shabaab militia by Kenya's military in October of last year. CCTV's Mohamed Hirmoge tells us more. At least 17 people were killed on Friday and Saturday as clashes between rival clan militia escalate in the southern port city of Kismayu. Tensions flared on Friday as forces loyal to the leader of the Raskamboni Brigade, Ahmed Mohamed Islam, clashed with a rival militia loyal to Iftin Hassan Basto, another self-declared president of the controversial Jubaland region. Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud and UN Special Envoy Nicholas K called for an immediate ceasefire between rival militia fighting over control of the port city. As a government, we are saddened that after 22 years, we see Somali shedding their fellow countrymen's blood once again. We have seen politics handled maturely, and we as a federal government want a political solution where no blood will be spilled again in Kismayu. The clashes broke out on Friday and have since caused displacement. The Mogadishu administration has since disowned the formation of Jubaland and its five self-declared presidents. It is time that those who are leading in this country and those who are playing a leading role in Kismayo decide to choose peace, decide to discuss their differences and their legitimate differences at the table. They should exchange ideas and views and not exchange gunfire. Amisom's Kenya Defense Forces liberated the port city from Al-Shabaab fighters in October last year. Administering the lucrative port has always remained the cause of numerous battles in Somalia's 21 years of chaos. It's a time of great hope. The people here need peace. Everything is there, ready to build that peace and build a new Somalia. We're committed to it. I know the federal government and president is committed to it as well. But we can't be blind to the real risks and challenges as well. With Al-Shabaab no longer in control of the city, various Somali clans are keen on taking over the administration of the port. Mohamed Hirmogi, CCTV, Mogadishu. All right, Mohamed Hirmogar is joining us now live from the Somali capital, Mogadishu. Mohamed, more than a dozen killed in Kismayu. What is the latest on this situation? Yeah, Beatrice, after 17 people have been killed, mostly civilians on Saturday and Friday, uh, tensions uh, remain, uh, the city remained a little calm on Sunday and today, that is on Monday. There have been efforts by clan elders to pacify the city, even as opposing sides still occupy their positions within the city. Uh, now the calls come out also coming from the capital over here in Mogadishu where the president has called uh, for the Kismayu people to actually give dialogue chance. But that still does not change the position of the administration in Mogadishu where they have disowned the entire jubilant region that supposedly Kismayu has to be the administrative capital and the five declared, self-declared presidents over there. Yet again, uh, over here there have been calls from the United Nations special envoy to Somalia, Ambassador Nicholas K, who has also said that Somalis in Kismayo and in the lower Juba regions have to pursue other means to pacify the region and note uh, resort to killing one another, he said. After 22 years, it looks like Somalia has not, did not learn its lessons from the two decades of conflict. Therefore, tensions are still high in Kismayo. Some displacement was reported. But if these uh, conflicts escalate, it is threatening to cause further displacement over there in the capital. However, uh, positions, clan militias still holding on to their positions. There's ceasefire, however, relatively, and clan elders are working really hard to bring the, the two sides into dialogue, Beatrice. All right. Uh, President Mahmoud there, uh, Mohammed, as you mentioned, is asking the warring sides to give dialogue a chance. But what is the hula baloo about, though, in Kismayu? There is ongoing fighting while it was expected to pick up after the Al-Shabaab were driven out of the port city. 
Sure, the expectations were really high in Kismayo after the Al-Shabaab have been driven out by the Kenya Defense Forces in October of last year. Uh, everybody thought this will rise into a commercial uh, town, a commercial city that will fully exploit the potential of the port. But then again, uh, one thing that should not be lost on us is the fact that Kismayo has always remained the site of numerous battles over the last 22 years. This country has been in chaos. Reasons are both political and economic. Political because Kismayo is the administrative capital of what is now called the Jubaland region that forms the lower Juba, the middle Juba, and the Gado regions that form a large swathes of southern Somalia. Then that means with the federalism factor in Somalia right now, many clan warlords want to take control of Kismayo. And when you have the control of Kismayo as the administrative capital, then you can control the entire southern Somalia. That might be even more powerful than the Mogadishu administration, that is one. The other factor is economic. The lucrative port of Kismayo, if exploited well, could generate millions of dollars. And just to give an example is, we know in the year 2011, Al-Shabaab got uh, $25 million in revenue only from the export of charcoal from the port city. Therefore, a lot of resources involved in Kismayo and that is a bone of contention and that's why every other warlord that's why al-shabaab included and the somali government doesn't want to give out kismayo to anybody that is the hula baloo that is that is the bone of contention in kismayo beatrice all right uh cctv's mohammed hirmoge on the latest in kismayo thank you now former south african leader nelson mandela is in a serious but stable condition tonight and that's the latest official word from the country's presidency the 94-year-old Mandela was hospitalized on Saturday with a recurring lung infection. He is at the intensive care unit. Day three of Nelson Mandela's hospital stay and journalists camped outside his home in Houghton, Johannesburg, where well wishes have left messages of hope and courage. But most of the focus was once again on the heart clinic in Pretoria, where the international media have broadcast from for the past few days. Nelson Mandela's daughter, Zinzi, and her mother, Winnie Madikizela Mandela, arrived to visit with the 94-year-old Nobel Peace Prize laureate on Monday afternoon. The South African presidency remained adamant on Monday that Nelson Mandela's condition had remained unchanged since he was admitted to hospital during the early hours of Saturday morning. But many South Africans said it was time for the nation to have a change of heart and accept that their beloved leader, Nelson Mandela, is old, frail and seriously ill. We wish him well, but at the same time, it's very selfish to, to, to keep the old men like this. We love Tata. Tata, we have done a lot for the nation. The nation adores you. You are our icon. But, well, as it is now, if it's so painful, let, let's let the men go. Let's let Tata go. I just want to say we love you, Tata. And thank you for everything you've done for us. And we, we love, love you, Tata. Tata. My heart is feeling so sad that he's sick. Was, uh, but like I think he's done enough. Maybe it's about time. Maybe if time like uh, has arrived like, for him like to go, that God can take him. But he's done enough. We'll remember him every time in our lives. He's the hero of South Africa. Madiba's old friend and comrade, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, said the South African nation offered its thanks to God for the extraordinary gift of Nelson Mandela. Rene Dalcom, CCTV, Pretoria. And we'll take another short break here on Africa Live. Still ahead on the program. The horn is infused with a cocktail of, um, of toxins, of medicinal compounds, specially formulated for use on animals, so 100% safe to the rhino, but um, unfit for human consumption. Staying in South Africa, beware! South Africa rhino poachers are put on notice. Africa, an amazing world.
is coming closer to us. A new voice. We have made an excellent beginning. A new view. Let's watch together. We deliver news and views. Let's explore together. We get you inside real Africa. Every day, only on CCTV News. This is Africa Live on CCTV News with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Now, wildlife officials in South Africa have unveiled a dramatic new weapon that will be used to boost war on rhino poaching. Apparently, more than 270 of the animals have been slaughtered this year for their horns, which feed a market worth millions of dollars. Nonetheless, the horns are now being rendered worthless thanks to a quick injection. CCTV's Travis Andrews has that story. A new day breaks over South Africa's spectacular Sabi Sand Reserve. It's a new day too in the fight to protect the country's rhinos. Officials here on the first mission of its kind, a mass poisoning of rhino horns. We're doing a rhino horn infusion as an anti-poaching measure. Uh, horn infusions are basically um, an alternative to dehorning of animals. You know, no one really travels to Africa to see the big four and a half because of, all of the rhinos have had to be dehorned. So with this procedure, the horn is infused with a cocktail of, um, of toxins, of medicinal compounds, specially formulated for use on animals, so 100% safe to the rhino, but um, unfit for human consumption. So it's bound to make someone really ill if they were to ingest it or handle it or even if they were to grind it to a fine powder and inhale it. The market for rhino horn has been booming in recent years. The demands coming from the Far East. People believe wrongly that the horn can cure ill such as cancer and that's how push up prices to around $65,000 a kilogram. With this program the horns are rendered toxic and worthless. They even died, so anyone tempted to buy them will think twice. The toxins inside of it uh, creates nausea, uh, vomiting, and, and often uh, can have some sort of uh, neurological effects um, when ingested. So, so the idea is basically to, to the end user becomes very sick. Um, it's not, uh, not something that, that we uh, want to eventually get to the end user, we're not trying to basically get it, it's, it's a more deterrent beforehand so that if people know that it could make them sick that they don't use it. The idea is if the horn cannot be sold, the poachers won't take the risk in pursuing and slaughtering the animals. It's a dramatic measure, but all attempts so far to hold poaching have yet to show a result. If anything, the poachers are becoming even bolder. Officials are hoping this mission can turn the tide. At the current rate, rhinos could become extinct in South Africa within just a few years. Since the beginning of this year, over 250 rhinos have fallen victim to illegal poach activities in this region alone. Yet the Sabi Sands Reserve at the Kruger National Park, desperate measures have had to be introduced. A highly toxic cocktail of pesticides now resides within the horns of the local rhino population here. And consumption of these horns in any way could lead to severe illness something that's likely to send shockwaves in the international black market trade of rhino horns. Travis Andrew, CCTV, from the Sabi Sand Reserve at the Kruger National Park. Now, over the years, heavy rains have devastated parts of Nigeria, killing hundreds and forcing millions from their homes. Nigeria's National Emergency Management Agency reported that more than 300 people died from flooding since the start of July through the end of October last year. The Nigerian government has now stepped up efforts to help its citizens from the effects of flooding. Wazir Hamsin tells us more. In 2012, Nigerian officials reported that 2.1 million people were displaced due to the heavy rains. The officials warned that the number might be higher this year as the country experienced heavy rains in the month of May. The government is already on the ground evacuating people from the affected areas. Since the inception of the collapse of the building, <clears throat> the local state government has been trying their best uh, when cooperating with the, those that are living in this uh, circle that the 
in this zone where the house collapsed. They have not relented in their efforts. They have been cooperating, trying their best to see that things went well. The first set they gave, I think they gave them some money. They gave them at least, I think, 200,000. And they told them to get an accommodation for a year. And thereafter, they are going to... And thereafter, they are going to come back. I think they, they had a memorandum of understanding, if I could use that word. Authorities have banned any construction work at night, weekends and public holidays. Already the safety standards team is carrying out assessments on all buildings to ensure that the safety standards are adhered to. When a development is becoming very rapid, when the city is expanding, and there is dichotomy between the rate of development and inspection, official inspection of site. So you create a crisis situation where so many activities are being done without paying attention to standard. The heavy rains and flooding have taken a serious toll on Nigeria's economy, disrupting key industries. Oil production has declined by about 500,000 barrels a day. However, the government is working hard to overcome these challenges caused by the heavy rains. Wazir Khamsin, CCTV. Well, now to matters food. And yes, quite some delicious food. The town of Randberg in South Africa played host to the ninth annual Oyster Wine and Food Festival. Now, over 40,000 fresh oysters were on sale at the festival. Here are more details about this sumptuous occasion. Over 7,000 food lovers from all over South Africa. Fresh, juicy oysters, large selection of wines, oyster dishes brought them here. It was the largest oyster festival in Kaltain province. Over 30 seafood exhibitors and wine exhibitors made a kill from the sales. It was a festive mood for both adults and children, an occasion to remember. No, I've never tried oysters before. Yeah. Today is going to be the first time for us to try oysters. Hey, oysters are delicious. There's no two ways about it. Wine and oysters just make you feel lovely. And champagne. And champagne. And the freshness of the ocean and living in Gauteng where we don't have the ocean, yeah. it's just comforting. The festival ran for two consecutive days. Carol Oyola, CCTV.